Well, thank you for coming. Um, it's obviously an interesting time, um, and um, that means that we want to try to understand it. That's our job. Um, and we've got, as it were, a three-part strategy for that right now. So let me tell you about, about that a little bit. So um, I have dropped my winter seminar topic, um, and so I'm doing a seminar on bailouts in the, in the winter. Uh, professors Baird and Henderson have uh, volunteered to help with that. Um, so that will be in the winter quarter. We're going to start with the Homeowners Loan Corporation from the 1930s and work our way forward. Um, so um, that should be, I think, very interesting uh, and a great learning opportunity for all of us. That's why we want to do it. That's one piece of a strategy. Second piece of a strategy is we're in the process of organizing a conference uh, on this for the spring. Uh, we're still figuring out exact dates and then we'll make an announcement on that. That will be you know, a standard academic, let's see what we can understand, write papers type conference. But again, um, a little bit of time will have passed. We will have done the seminar, so that will be helpful for us. And then the third piece of this is we wanted to do something now to get going. Um, and, and the idea of having a panel or two on this uh, was the idea, and that gets us here. Finding a time to have a panel turns out to be difficult. I know the business school is doing a number of things right now. So there's a lecture. John can talk about that. But there's a lecture series, four parts on that. Um, those are being webcast, so I'm going to watch those that way. But it might be fun to go to those live. And then there's a variety of writing going on at the GSB also on this. Uh, John's got something on his website. Uh, Luigi Zingales has something on his website. Um, and, and this morning, uh, Anil Kashup and, and Doug Diamond have something on the Freakonomics blog. So a bunch of writing going on there. John can tell you whether there's more stuff going on as well. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, the, you know, the ground plan, as it were, for the year here at least. Um, you know, it should be very interesting. All right, um, I want to sort of set this up. That's what I'm going to do. Then John's going to talk a little bit, then, then Todd, and then, and then Douglas, and then we'll just take questions. Um, and, and what we can say is, is that things are, um, you know, uh, clearer today than they were 72 hours ago. Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to move, so you'll have to follow me. So, so um, you know, a, a week ago, I don't know what we would have said. We would have talked about the bailout bill, and I'm going to do that a little bit. But over the last 72 hours, at least three pieces of this have come into firmer focus, and I just want to make sure you've got those, though it's been all over the newspapers the last two days. So one piece of this is the execution of the first piece of the TARP. Right, and the TARP is the rescue plan uh, that comes out of the um, EESA, which was passed on October 3rd. That's this $250 billion injection of capital to the, to the banking system. Talk about that a little bit uh, in just a second. That's one piece of that. That's described here, this voluntary capital purchase program. Second piece of this is an, a guarantee now, a new guarantee that the FDIC is going to do. Um, with regard to a variety of new debt going forward. This is different than the deposit account increase from 100000 to 250 that's in the EESA. This is something new. And then the third piece of this is the Fed is rolling out its, its commercial paper program. Um, so that has really all come into focus really in the last um, 72 hours. Um, and, and that's worth looking at in some detail. Uh, so the TARP program, uh, the first $250 billion, and as we'll see when we get to the bill quickly, you know, they contemplate a maximum of $700 billion. That's divided into to layers. So there's a first $250, and then we get to $350, and then mechanisms to get to $700. Um, we basically spent $125 billion uh, yesterday and over the weekend. Um, this is a preferred stock investment uh, into these banks. Um, so uh, the TARP initially was contemplated as being about buying particular assets from these institutions. A lot of controversy about that because there are obviously enormous lemons problems there. They're going to try to sell you the really bad ones and hope you'll overpay. Now these are actual preferred stock investments coupled with warrants in the banks. At terms that are seen as being very favorable to the banks, meaning Warren Buffett's getting better terms, um, which means Warren Buffett is smarter than the US government, but I guess we knew that. Um, these have to be seen as measured against the private benchmark as being, you know, subsidies, no doubt about that, but maybe a better form of subsidies than simply overpaying for assets. So that program is rolling out, um, and then the figures on that yesterday in the New York Times, oh, I don't want to do this, sorry. In the New York Times, you should have seen these yesterday, which basically says, here's how we're spending $125 billion. 
a lot of detail in this morning's newspapers about, and these are really interesting from corporate governance standpoints, of exactly how this was done. Basically, Paulson, Bernanke, and then uh, Tim Geithner, who is the, the head of the New York Fed, called these nine guys in for a meeting and said, we're going to have a meeting. You show up at 3. We'll talk for a while. We'll see what happens. And by 6.30, these guys are signing pieces of paper, which are selling preferred stock in their companies to, these, to, to the tune of these numbers. So very rapid decision making, uh, but I think also seen as very favorable terms. And here is the way the money's being kicked into these institutions. And also, the New York Times is trying to give you a sense of how, that, how those numbers match to uh, both the assets and the current shareholder equity in these institutions. So $25 billion for Wells Fargo is a lot. Uh, no, less so, as it were, for Citigroup. OK, that was piece one of this, the TARP. Then piece two of this is this temporary liquidity guarantee program uh, that the FDIC has implemented. Um, the TARP, obviously, is being done pursuant to the EESA. Then part two of this is, is a guarantee program for new unsecured debt going forward, covering a variety of debt at these banks. Um, this is intended to be priced, so you'll see the pricing structure below. It's not intended to be um, an actual expenditure of taxpayer money, though if a bunch of banks go broke, we'll see where we are. Uh, but this is intended to incentivize new debt, the rollover of old debt into the new debt, and to provide a mechanism for, for that debt uh, to be created in a fairly straightforward way. This is not under the new legislation. There is seemingly older legislation which gives the Secretary of the Treasury the power to flick a switch and say it's sort of an emergency. Here's what we can do. That's 1991 legislation. That was done by the FDIC yesterday. And then the third piece of what happened yesterday is are the additional details about the Fed's commercial paper program. That will be direct lending to private firms in the face of what's been a, in, you know, an implosion or a severe drop, at least in the short term, in, in the functioning of the commercial paper market, $95 billion came out under that in one week. Go look at Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act if you haven't done that recently. Most of you probably have. Well, maybe not. OK. Um, it's actually shockingly broad as to what the Fed can do. Um, and so in terms of their authority that's there, you can look at the terms and conditions of that. Uh, the Wall Street Journal announced this morning that I guess PIMCO and Bill Gross has been hired uh, to run that. That's all happened in the last 72 hours. So um, we now have a much better sense of exactly what this program is going to look like. Um, I want to talk just briefly about the EESA itself. This is the legislation that was put in place um, uh, on October 3rd. Uh, this is the legislation that initially uh, the House didn't, didn't approve. Uh, the Senate did. It went back to the House. They approved it. There's a lot there. I mean, it's worth looking through it. And I'm going to stop in the interest of time and not give too much detail. One of the very interesting things here is the broad definition of what counts as a troubled asset. So initially, as I was saying, this was really envisioned as a, let's buy mortgages and securities based upon those. So if you looked at the initial draft of the bill, the Paulson bill, it was like a three-page bill, incredibly simple. That definition was expanded to pick up any other financial instrument that the secretary determines a purchase of which is necessary to promote financial market stability. I guess that's pretty broad. Um, so obviously a very expansive sense of what might be a troubled asset. That has had the virtue, I guess, of facilitating then the sort of capital investments that we're seeing right now in these form of these preferred shares. Absent this, they, they couldn't do that. So it's not, not clear that's, that's broad enough. I mean, I don't think anyone's asking the question, but it's not no, no. obvious that yeah, though, though, if you're litigating this case, you want to be here not, and not here, right? Well, yeah. yeah, okay. But, but still, the idea that, that an IOU is, is, is counted as an asset is not. Okay. Then there, I mean, we can go on and on, but I'm going to stop here. There's obviously provisions, as you might think, in this kind of legislation with regard to um, home, home mortgage reformation. Um, a variety of provisions with regard to executive compensation uh, uh, in terms of trying to limit executive compensation, limit golden parachutes. Um, uh, some interesting provisions with regard to um, if you're following the Wells Fargo Wachovia Citigroup litigation right now where, where Citi had sort of a standstill deal in an attempt to buy uh, Wells Fargo. Um, eventually, to buy, I'm sorry, Wachovia, then a, a deal is done with Wells Fargo. Um, Citibank sues for $60 billion. 
um, uh, Wells Fargo says Section 126 uh, says that standstill agreement was vo void, a void against public policy, uh, go away. Be interesting to see exactly what happens on that. Um, provisions about mark to market. Uh, I don't know, someone will probably talk about mark to market, but allowing the SEC to move away from that um, and then increasing deposit insurance uh, ceilings from $100,000 to $250,000. And then a final provision which basically says if the end of this deal, the government's lost money on it, uh, the president ought to come up with some way to get it back from the financial industry. The recoupment provision. That's what it says. So I have lots of economic things to say about all these policies and how they work and how they won't work. A lot about the latter. Uh, but let me save that for the question and answer and just give you my, some of the sense of what I think is uh, what, what we're looking for going ahead. Um, I think the greatest danger right now is, is not economic or financial, it's political. Uh, where I see panic is in Washington far more than on Wall Street. Um, piling on new plans every 72 hours and now a contagion of bailouts that seem to have nothing to do with actually the financial crisis. Fundamentally my worry is that our politicians won't know when to say enough is enough, it's over, uh, declare victory and quit, uh, especially in an election year. Um, now let me make some sense out of that. So I have this slide up here. I've got to bring my supply and demand curve along. A credit crunch, what are we worried about? We're worried about a credit crunch. And a credit crunch is a time when the banking system cannot make new loans. That is, and that's the only thing that we should be worried about here. We're not worried about individual banks failing if there's another bank that can take up their business or if their assets can be married with new capital and keep going. We shouldn't be worried about people losing money on stupid things they did or even smart things they did that didn't work out. That's not the objective of policy. The objective of policy is, and, the obje and a financial crisis is, and is only a time when the banking system can't make new loans. So here's your supply and demand curve. As interest rates go up, people, savers, are willing to supply more loans through the banking system. As interest rates go up, people don't demand as many loans, right, because uh, projects are less profitable. Supply and demand equal, that's how the market's supposed to work. A credit crunch is a time when the banking system isn't working which you can think of as a big spread between supply and demand. It's, it's as if there's wheat in the fields and hungry people at the store, but all the trucks are broken so we can't get the bread to the store. That's, that's what a credit crunch is. This usual story but become lack of capitalization, can't make your uh, capital requirements and so forth. Um, now, a lot of what we're going to see in the next couple months is not credit crunch. And, and I don't, my worry is that I don't think our Politicians will be able to understand that. So here's not credit crunch scenario one. People woke up a couple months ago and said, you know, risky stuff is risky. I don't think I want to make so many risky loans. The supply of money into risky loans went down because people realized there's more risk that they, than they thought out there. That's going to be with us. And there's nothing the financial system can do about that or should do about that. Uh, you know, we shouldn't go back to making the kind of risky loans we were making before, now that we understand there's risk. But in that situation, fewer loans get made. There are going to be fewer subprime loans to people with no jobs and no down payments. That's a fact of life. That's a good thing. There's nothing that policy can or should do about that. Another thing that's not a credit crunch, we're heading into a recession. That's going to happen anyway. There's lots of reasons to have recessions. In a recession, people don't want to borrow so much. Well, when people don't want to borrow so much, loans go down. There's nothing about a credit crunch involving that. That's a natural operation of a recession. I forecast what we're going to see declines in loans made, and our political apparatus is going to be giving us new rescue plans every 72 hours, not realizing that, that you know, the battle was over there. We will see higher prices for lower credit quality. We'll see that for years. We'll see less loan demand. We'll see house prices going down. There will be a recession. But none of that necessarily has anything to do with, with a credit crunch. Banks, the credit crunch is when banks are unable to make new loans, not when they are sensibly unwilling to do so. Now, policy. Here's my worry about policy. It's already chaotic. The Treasury plan, when this started on September was 22nd, 24th, when, when Bernanke came to Congress, an ashen-faced central banker comes with three pages saying something as terrible is about to happen. There's an immediate danger to the economy if you don't act in, in three days. But I'm not going to tell you what it is, nor am I going to bring any numbers, though we did ban short selling on banks over the weekend. I can't imagine a way to induce panic more effectively than doing that. <laughs> 
Last Friday, I gave a talk down at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I talked with a bunch of traders. This was the weekend before the uh, finance ministers around the world got together. Traders I talked to were, were they were busy. It was very nice of them to talk to me. The rumor they had heard was that these guys were going to get together and ban short selling of everything all over the world by Monday morning, and they better get stuff out of their portfolios they didn't want now. An entirely reasonable thing to worry about. Certainly, they could have come out doing that, but, but you, know, you can imagine people worrying about that is causing a lot of problems, and so forth. Bailout contagion. Let me give an example. The, the McCain plan is to buy at face value mortgages from individual banks on people's primary residences where they had down payment, had credit, didn't lie on their applications, and could get a lowball valuation. Well, it's nice, but the problem is that banks have underwater mortgage-backed securities. You can't buy an individual mortgage out of a mortgage-backed security. It's in the security. They were on investment property, not individual's loans, from people without down payments and who didn't have any jobs and did lie on their applications. Those are the things causing the bank problems. Fixing these isn't going to do any good. Now, you know, the message here is once you start bailing out shareholders of banks and other people, it's very hard to stop bailing out. And I, I'm afraid we're in this contagion to bail out everybody who ever made a bad decision. It's very hard for the political system not to do that, especially in an election year, but it has nothing to do with solving the banking crisis. Um, tonight, there's going to be a debate. I forecast more plans to cure the credit crunch. <laughs> Uh, a pinata of fiddling around with the tax code, like the many obscene additions to the Treasury bill that you saw some of, all of which have nothing to do with the banking, uh, banking crisis. There's already talk of another fiscal stimulus, stimulus, which is about the stupidest thing in the world. <laughs> the premise of fiscal stimulus is that the problem with the U.S. economy is we don't borrow enough and we don't consume enough. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> A majority of the voters has just discovered they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury, and you know what happens next. Okay, uh, bank, the, right now, the, all the, the set, last 72 hours, the government now owns large shares of banks. Should we worry about this? Well, I worry tremendously. Uh, preferred versus voting makes no distinction. If Paulson can get them all in a room and in, tw in a, a couple hours say, you know, you're going to do this preferred issue that you don't want to, Imagine when the government says, comes calling and says, no, here's what we want you to do. Does the fact they can't vote shares make any difference here? What happens when the government owns banks? Well, the government got us into a lot of this problem. The Community Re Investment Act, Fannie and Freddie, the government was shoving bad loans down the banking system's throat. And now that they have preferred shares and this kind of lending, it should and will stop. You can, you can imagine uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure to give loans to all sorts of favorite groups. We just made a $25 billion loan to Ford and GM to invest in alternative energy technology, which Toyota has running on Priuses. I would, you know, when, as GM heads to bankruptcy, look for a consortium of private banks to come to the rescue to keep it off, off the government's book. Every, every corrupt government does things through favored loans in the banking system, not directly. That's the danger of, of having... Um, the government that deeply involved in banks. And fundamentally, our problem is that many banks are insolvent. They've got stuff on their assets that is not equal to the liabilities. What happens when something's insolvent? It needs to be closed down in an orderly way. The claims of shareholders and debt, A, wiped, da wiped out and B, written down, married to new equity and the assets, the, the business going on. With a government investment, how is equity going to form, how is this equity going to have its role as a cushion? No bank that took those loans is going down. This is the Banker and Bank Shareholder Protection Act, as far as I can tell. The role, what are we going to do if these things need to be liquidated? We're not. We're going to prop them up. Now, uh, I don't want to say that all is right with the financial system or was, and that's why I'm particularly glad to come to the law school. Um, how do we get in the problem that we're in? One big view, I, I think, is that we have a bankruptcy code that is not at all suited to a large, complex financial institution. To an economist like me, bankruptcy is easy. Oh, assets not worth liabilities? Fine. We're going to come in. The equity gets nothing. The debt gets written down. The debt now owns the assets. The debt sells those assets off. So now the people, computers, and you know, all the rest of it can make new loans. Uh, we recapitalize and we're off 10 minutes later, everything's working. <laughs> That's not how bankruptcy works in a regular company. And certainly, if we, if we tried to send something through Chapter 11, it would be a bloody disaster. 
Uh, it, the current system works great for Joe's hardware store, who's having trouble making back its bank loans. But it can't possibly work for financial institutions. And that's what we're doing is in, I think the way to view what the policy is doing is, in good Chicago style, implementing ex post something like what the right contract should have been ex ante. Uh, but if, if, you, if a bank gets in trouble in every swap contract, everybody with a brokerage account, everybody with some repo deal winds up in bankruptcy court fighting over you know, who gets to sell the executive limo in order to satisfy their needs. You know, we're going to be there for years and the whole bankruptcy system will go down. So my challenge to you, <laughs> uh, design a bankruptcy code and a capital structure for financial institutions. You have three hours. Go. <laughs> we have a couple of years that lets this process happen. The current one that we have where banks finance themselves with a lot of overnight debt and in trouble have to threaten Chapter 11, that, that isn't going to work. Well, you know, got to have something for our lawyers to do. Okay, Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so I also wanted to talk about supply and demand curves, and I thought I was going to be clever, but uh, I've learned my lesson, never match supply and demand curves with an economist. So <laughs> let me just say a few things about supply and demand. Uh, the first one is banks, I think consistent with what John said, I don't really disagree with much of what he, what he said, uh, banks have had access to basically f almost free money for over a year. The Fed has loosened monetary policy in, this, in, the, in the country. They've had tons of access to this. Uh, of course, there's a problem here, and that is what got us into the problem in the first place, was uh, loose monetary policy. Uh, but they've had it, and the problem is people don't, there's no demand for loans. Uh, not a lot of people want to borrow from banks, even if they could lend to them, and I think they've had access to capital, they've had access to more capital. The problem is there's not a huge demand for loans. Part of the reason, I think, is political uncertainty we're in the middle of an election season, as John said, so there's tons of silliness. There's also the uncertainty about exactly whether or not the loans that you're taking out now to invest in projects are going to be sensible in a new political environment. So we hear things about uh, the environment and global warming and how our cities are all going to be flooded. And so as a consequence, we need to completely get rid of the internal combustion en engine within the next 10 years. Well, this is obviously the stuff of science fiction, but it also creates lots of potential uncertainty for businesses and individuals. Should I buy a car? Because I don't know. Maybe these cars are not going to be worth anything because we're not going to be uh, using oil. Uh, when the when the uh, credit cra or the uh, the stock market crashed in 1929, the reaction of first President Hoover and then President Roosevelt was raise taxes. Uh, Institute protectionism, the, you know, if anybody's seen uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the uh, smooth holly tariff act, uh, right? So raise taxes, uh, uh, put in place protectionism measures, uh, institute lots of new regulations for business, and basically prosecute slash persecute the business leaders and people who were responsible for getting, uh, allegedly responsible for causing the crash in the first place. These themes should sound somewhat familiar in our political season. So since this is funded by the Republicans and Democrats, I'll be political for a second and say, this is exactly the wrong kind of kind of environment that we need to get out of the crisis that we're in. So comments about uh, you know, national service corps and spreading the wealth around, and new, uh, no, this is bad. This creates lots of uncertainty for people's investments and exactly the wrong uh, political vector that we need. So the bailout plan, which uh, was ably described by Professor Picker, uh, it's one thing to think of this bailout plan in the hands of uh, Republicans. Not a great track record for the last eight years, to be sure. But imagine this plan in the hands of Republicans and, and, and Hank Paulson, for example, uh, or John McCain uh, with a veto pen over what the Congress might do. But then imagine the bailout plan in the broad language with uh, a different administration. And it may be that those have different things. So for example, the Republicans might think, well, this is a necessary evil to save capitalism. Uh, or we could be Barney Frank, who said, um, what we have in mind is comparable to what Franklin Roosevelt did in the New Deal. OK, if you're a business, this sends shutters down your spine. Okay? And so the, the idea, my point here, is just that there is uncertainty created by what is going to happen with the legislation that we've seen here in the next, uh, in the next four years. And I think that uh, creates a problem. Okay, 
a couple more points quickly about supply of loans. So one good news, one piece of good news is the size of our bailout is very small, five percent of GDP, something like that at the present. This compares with about thirty percent in the UK and, and over sixteen percent in Germany. So so far, on a relative basis, the U.S. is getting off fairly easy, and lots of people are feeling our pain. So if misery loves company, that should be something that we take comfort in. In two thousand and six, Walmart. Everybody knows Walmart? They proposed to be a bank. And the government, because they were taking word from the cartel of big banks uh, that existed, said, no, no, you can't be a bank. We really wish that Walmart was a bank today. If the problem is supply of money and people willing to offer, as John said, just the trucks that get the money between the borrowers and the lenders, Walmart would be a nice addition to this. But the cartelization uh, and the ability to use Washington to uh, preserve existing market share, kept Walmart out, and we could use more banks. Why do we need Citigroup? Why not have Target and Walmart and other people enter and become banks and serve that role? There's absolutely no reason, in my opinion, why not. In terms of demand, uh, quickly, uh, there's a demand problem for houses. We've got too many houses, we invested too much money in houses, and we need people to buy houses. So here's an idea, open the borders. Tell everybody who wants to come to the United States, if you, if you live in India and you've got a PhD in mechanical engineering, I've got a condo in Miami for you. <laughs> and I'm only being half joking here. Seriously, there is a huge need more people to live here, to, to live in these houses. So my sense is we take the H-1B visa program and we multiply it by 10,000 and let them come here. Um, I, I, I could break into a Neil Diamond song here, but I, but I won't. <laughs> okay, um, uh, one thing about uh, politics, I think, which is uh, another uh, element of this, and that is the political rancor in Washington, which we all sort of encourage with name-calling and, 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 uh, and demonizing our enemies, I think has real economic consequences. And I think this is a good example. So the, the House had uh, eight bills proposed to regulate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and over 40 hearings from the period 1996 to 2006. And those were blocked largely by Democrats in uh, the House. <laughs> this, is, this is Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> largely blocked by Democrats. <laughs> But and here's my point about political rancor. For, for understandable reasons to some extent, the Congressional Black Caucus felt like Republicans were picking on poor black people. And their belief that that was true has some legitimacy because for a long time Republicans had seemed like or actually had picked on poor black people. So when the Republicans urged that there needed to be regulations on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it, they couldn't credibly signal that it was a legitimate public policy objective because it could have just been that they had uh, they wanted to sort of you know stick it to the poor uh, inner city people. So my claim here is that political rancor has economic costs, and the kind of games that go on in Washington that uh, make people unable to to signal credibly what they're really after, I think, has a real consequence. And the last thing I'll say um, is that quasi is a really a four-letter word. Uh, the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac situation, which got us in this problem in the first place, it was a quasi-governmental entity. Uh, quasi is very bad. The program originally was a New Deal program, as Professor Picker said, we'll talk about that in the bailout conference. Uh, Lyndon Johnson moved Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac off the government's balance sheet in 1968 because he wanted to do some budget shenanigans to pay for the war in Vietnam. This was the first Enron off balance sheet accounting. Get this thing off of our balance sheet so what we, the, the real state of the world can be hidden from the American people. And now that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is over here, it's got a quasi-governmental guarantee we did bail them out, which means private parties don't do the diligence they should. And Congress, because it's quasi-private, doesn't do the oversight that it should. So I, I'm here to say, if we believe in wealth redistribution, that is, give money to poor people to buy houses, we should write them checks. The, go the Congress should just take the money from me, write a check, and hand it to the poor person and say, buy a house. Or the government should build a house and rent it to the, to the people. The whole uh, intermediation of these quasi-governmental agencies where you have the greed and the lack of oversight is the worst of both possible worlds. So in absolute free market, we say, you're on your own, or a world in which we say, here's checks, because we believe in a social safety net. Those are feasible, legitimate worlds. 
The world we're in right now, I think, is uh, indefensible. And I'll stop there. I'm just going to talk briefly because I think what we really want to do is open things to, um, to, to, to questions. I, I guess I would make, um, uh, just to create a little bit of controversy, um, I don't think John's right at all about the bankruptcy system um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, the Lehman bankruptcy is over, and it was over in about five days. Um, the automatic stay in bankruptcy does not apply to swaps and all these other exotic instruments. And bankruptcy was completely transparent to them. Um, people could argue about whether or not it's a good or bad idea, but the reality is the parties and counterparties to swaps and repos brought about massive changes in the bankruptcy code in 2005, and they bought and paid for every member of the House, every member of the Senate, and they got exactly the law they thought was in their self-interest. And maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but you know, bankruptcy wasn't long, wasn't costly, and it's what the relevant interest groups bargained for. It's a classic situation of people who are on both sides of the transaction lobbied for this particular law. Um, as far as what happened in terms of the procedure, the major Lehman assets were sold on the Friday after the Monday in which um, Lehman, Lehman filed. Um, the the broker-dealer operation and everything else was completely transparent to the rest of the world, and bankruptcy is, well, okay, I, I'm sounding defensive, which I, I don't mean to do. Okay, well, okay, but at any rate, um, let's, um, the question I would press John on, which is not something I know anything about, is that if I'm sort of translating what he said into, you know, my worst fears, is that the big problem here is we still don't know what assets these banks are holding. You know, are, are they holding, um, you know, we know they bought some of these um, securitized assets. We don't know how much in the way of subprime loans they hold. We don't know the value of what they hold. We, we essentially, we know that when Lehman filed, um, just before Lehman filed, people looked at their assets and didn't like what they saw. But, but the question is whether or not that's going to replicate itself with respect to other assets. Um, last week, when the um, credit default swaps of Lehman, were, they tried to settle up, they, they, they essentially gave an estimate of the value of Lehman's unsecured assets at less than 10 cents in the dollar. Um, and uh, I don't know. So, John, the question is, um, you said, no, it is true. If one or two banks are insolvent and they completely disappear, well, you know, who cares? Um, but if they're all insolvent, that's probably a little bit more of a problem. So as between one or two being insolvent or all of them being insolvent? We'll back that. Uh, <laughs> 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 all right, we're going to, I'm going to rearrange the room while you're talking. Go ahead. Okay, start to move some of this stuff out of the way. Go ahead. So uh, over here. Yeah, so I don't think it's the case that all the banks are insolvent. I do, that's good. That's I do good. think it's the case that we have to find out who's insolvent, and, and when they are, I, I'm glad to hear bankruptcy law works. I thought, I thought Lehman was great, uh, but then I hear all this stuff in the newspapers about how terrible letting Lehman go bankrupt was. Oh, no, I think people didn't understand, uh, uh, but don't shoot the messenger. I mean, the, the problem is that, is that when Lehman filed, all of a sudden, um, you know, you had these, um, you have these counterparty and other risks that, that, that we're, we're dealing with. Um, and, you know, you have potential bank runs and things like that, but that's not because the bankruptcy system wasn't working smoothly. In other words, your vision those of bankruptcy... Those are two very different those inquiries, are, yeah, right? No, the no. bankruptcy system's not designed to solve systemic externalities. You know, your, your, right? your, your complaint was... It doesn't well, do that. Um, what you really dream of, you know, your fantasy world as an economist, is that, you know, you, <laughs> you, you shut these suckers down, you sell off the assets, and it's all over in a couple of minutes. Well, it took five days, but that was Which is a couple minutes in the real world. Yeah, so, right? so that wasn't... So the problem with the Lehman bankruptcy was the systemic... The systemic risk problem is the problem. So, uh, but wait, if if we do the Lehman bankruptcy and it works great, there is no systemic risk problem. Well, there is a systemic risk problem if all the banks are insolvent and we have to do this with all the banks. And if it takes a while for capital to reconnect with the people who borrow, the thing I notice is that we seem we as a set question of policy seem unwilling to let banks do that. So Bear right. Stearns, for example was bailed out. And there I gather the problem was people with brokerage accounts were worried their brokerage accounts would be dragged into bankruptcy court, which um, makes no sense. No, no, that's, that wouldn't happen. Then why was there a run on the Bear Stearns brokerage accounts? That's what um, I thought triggered the whole thing. Well, the, uh, there, there are a couple of different things. There's the, they're the actual broker-dealers, but they're the also, they're the, there's the problem that Bear Stearns is a counterparty to so many of these credit default swaps, and, and that's, a, that's a much bigger problem. But you just told me that's not a problem because that's well, handled well in bankruptcy. Oh no 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 no! Again, there are two different issues. One issue is the, you know, the the ability to solve 
you know, a particular counterparty that that, um, that fails. The the other problem is the, um, is this this counterparty problem. I mean, the the credit default swap problem is the um, is is a um, is potentially a, a big deal that these guys didn't completely think through. John, you must be tracking these numbers more than I am, but do we see a jump in LIBOR post, post Lehman? Uh, yes. LIBOR is the London interbank borrowing rate, right? It's, it's, it's critical in terms of how the banks lend to each other. Lots of markets in the, uh, lots of lending contracts are actually tied to LIBOR. That we see a, we see a, a shift in LIBOR after the Lehman? All sorts of, uh, um, it went a little, up a little after Lehman, but it, it's been up for a while. I mean, all sorts of lending to anything involving a financial institution carries a high interest rate. Uh, but but a, shift, for a, a, a shift here. But that's the critical point. There's right? a little shift. LIBOR's been relatively low, and now all of a sudden it's jumped. No, the big spreads between LIBOR and Treasury started much earlier. What date? Oh, God, I don't have the graph. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I say we should be at a point now, but we're going to run until 1.15 with people of class at 1.30. John needs to get back, so this is a great time to yeah, take, take questions. So, so anywhere yes. you want to go. In the middle. Okay. Why is it that uh, hedging and pork bellies and corn seems to work so much more smoothly than credit default swaps? Uh, I think, well, the, the, uh, there's a market, there's a well-organized marketplace for pork bellies. There's not a well-organized marketplace for credit default swaps. I mean, the, you know, the standard assertion that, that you know, the, the lay, assertion, lay assumption is free markets are unregulated. Well, the best free markets, like the Chicago Board of Trade, are heavily regulated, where there, there are all sorts of rules about who can trade, you know, your financial solvency of your ability to, to trade, guarantees of trades by other members of the institution, what contracts can be traded, what the contracts have to say, and so forth. The problem with the credit default swap market is there is there's no organized market. These things are done on pieces of paper that are just put in a filing drawer someplace. And what we're going to see eventually, and I think credit default swaps are wonderful, is eventually we will have a well-organized market, but it just takes a time for that market to organize itself. And in the interim, we have to sort out the problem that there is this market where people have a credit default swap, have another credit default swap, and think they have a completely hedged position. They have their, their, they, their long $4 trillion and their short $4 trillion, and they think their position is completely fine. The problem is if there's counterparty risk, if the person that you were short with was, um, give a random example, Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns, then all of a sudden, instead of having a hedged $4 trillion position, which is fine, you have a long four trillion dollar position, which is not so far. So, so I think there's wait, wait, in defense yeah. of credit default swaps, uh, the so the exchanges are regulated, but they are self-regulated. I mean, these rules are this yes, is not I, government. No, which is, no, no, I didn't say no. Okay, I, I, didn't I just mean, wanted to make sure we had the proper adjective there. This, the, in many of the same mechanisms, people doing these things are dumb. So in the over-the-counter <laughs> credit default swap, many of the same mechanisms are there. So in an exchange, you have to post collateral. And as the price goes down, you have to post more collateral. Well, credit default swaps have the same features when they're over the counter yeah. as well. Can I, can let me, I, think, I think she's asking a different question, which I think is a good question. I agree with everything Professor Baird said. That is, the market was not uh, as well matured as the Merck, right? Uh, the question, though, I think she's asking is, why is there 62, 52, whatever the number only, is, only 52, 52 trillion dollars worth of bets, and all they are is wagers, just like me betting on the ponies. It's exactly the same. The only reason that we don't allow me to bet on the ponies, uh, or I guess we now do to some extent, but we limit my ability to bet on the ponies, and we don't limit my ability to bet on whether or not GM is going to pay off its debt, is because we think the latter one serves a more, has some socially useful function, right? That playing in the stock market is exactly like playing on the slots, but we think there's some social function that is pricing uh, asset distribution and capital allocation in our capitalist economy is enhanced by the stock market. So her question is, we have this thing, the betting on credit, and we've got things like betting on soybeans, and why is it that the betting on soybeans is a fairly small market and the betting on credit is a $52 trillion market? So the secondary market on betting on whether or not someone pays off a loan. And I think that's a I think that's an excellent no, question. It's a great answer. I think what's that? Are you going to answer the question? <laughs> no, you are. Oh, I was well, happily. I, go ahead. I'd be, no, 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 please. please. <laughs> <laughs> this, this decreases the probability that I'll be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, one of us. 
it's good for you know, a lot of this stuff is is head. I mean, one man's bed is another man's hedge. Uh, if you own the bond, then you buy. It's just buying insurance. You're just buying insurance, and this thing works like any insurance company. Uh, you know, if, if there's a, you buy home insurance, and the insurance company has to have reserves, and if all the houses in Chicago go up in a fire, we might discover counterparts. But there's as many, but the secondary market, so yes, yeah, so the primary market of people buying insurance, I would agree, and that, the loan market is bigger than the soybean market, commercial loan market's bigger than the soybean market, so that would explain that. The CDO cubed, or to the fourth, or to the infinite, whatever the, the financial products are, where people are in creating synthetics, that replicate the risk from a GM bond. They could have just as easily replicated the synthetics that come from Frank Soybean Field in normal Illinois, and they didn't. Now, so one possible answer, I guess, is that people feel like they have um, some better access to information or some ability to make a guess about whether or not GM defaults on their bonds a little bit better than they would about Frank Soybean Farm. So, or or uh, a corporate default is an event that people care about in a way that the price of soybeans yeah. is not. There's also a dark, a dark story, again, um, <laughs> is, that, uh, is that what happens is that you want to mimic, the pro you, basically you have things that, um, that, you, that have a particular credit grade and you want to create synthetic securities that mimic those characteristics for purposes of regulatory arbitrage. Yeah. That's another problem. So and then one, one thing that I think to think about in terms of the story I was telling about this the socially useful function of this secondary market. We think it has some value. However, the problem with this secondary market is, as, uh, as uh, the, the uh, risk increases in that secondary market, uh, collateral must be uh, paid. As the value of these secondary bets fall, people need collateral uh, to pay off in the event that they are in the, on the losing side. So a lot of the money that the Treasury has been pumping into the economy has been going to be nothing but to serve as collateral on this $52 trillion market of secondary bets. But, so a social cost of this market that we've created that provides some information function is that it's sucking up enormous amounts of capital that could otherwise be deployed in the economy. So I'll just have one number I, I did receive. Um, layman's CDSs cleared. Nobody defaulted on them. And interestingly, once we figured everybody's both long and short, once it all netted up, the number I heard was $6 billion traded hands. Yeah. So there's hundreds of billions of dollars out there, but I'm both long and short, and that's the notion of the amount. And in the end, this one worked. You know, the, the, the problem, remember the problem here is a $52 trillion sounds like a lot of money, but it's, it's really less than that because what you have are the value of these contracts where it's A to B to C to D to E to F, and the, the total bet that's being made, the total no, naked long, naked short, is, is actually much smaller than $52 trillion. The problem is the way this market is set up, if I trade you a share of GM stock and then you sell that share of GM stock to somebody else and they sell it to somebody else, well, in the end, after I finish buying the GM stock and selling it, I'm out of the transaction. The problem with these credit default swaps is that the counterparty risk is, is still going to remain at all, at all relevant times. And, and you have to, the worry that people have, and this is why it's a systemic problem, is you have these links in the chain. All right, we're going to try to yeah. increase question volatility <laughs> and velocity. Maybe we'll okay. go there, when, please. When you're talking about the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy and Bear Stearns, what makes Bear Stearns too big to fail, as we kept hearing from Lehman Brothers not? And, you know, what, what, what is the brokerage accounts? And what is, what is well, you, you could argue that, that Lehman was too big to fail, too. And I think the problem with Bear, I mean, first Bear came first. So learning there was a fear curve. about learning the learning. And it might have been uh, sensible to do that first and then yeah. go the other way with Lehman. The other thing is, a lot of these credit default swaps were like pieces of paper. They, the, the market was so much, people were jotting down and throwing them on the floor. And Bear was viewed to be a major repository of pieces of paper on the floor. And I think the fear was if we didn't uh, bail them out, going through the pieces of paper on the floor and trying to figure out who owed what would have a sort of a contagion but if effect. We, but if we had a do-over, <laughs> we might not do it the same way. No guarantee. Please, go ahead. Yeah. Can anyone comment on what's the status of the Paulson report that was uh, issued earlier this year to designed to do a roadmap to solve some of these systemic problems we're talking about? Is Congress still talking about that, or did they still put that on the deck for so uh, I, I was on a, uh, I had a full day meeting uh, last Friday with some people who were at the SEC, <laughs> and they're obviously worried about, so the Paulson report was basically to, to uh, reconfigure the entire regulatory structure of how we regulate financial markets, and basically you know, bring a lot of the stuff that the CFTC and the SEC was doing into the Treasury Department. 
Um, they have very uncertain uh, views about what the future is of the SEC. There is a view that they will basically go to being only the regulators of the stock exchanges and doing criminal enforcement, effectively, uh, sort of a subsidiary of the De Department of Justice. Uh, and I think, you know, as this crisis uh, suggests, the Treasury is going to become much more powerful, and the Fed. And I think it, it forces us to reconsider, you know, we've got oversight mechanisms for those institutions and degrees of independence. So the SEC's got five commissioners, could be three of one party and two of another, they serve five-year terms, right? The Federal Reserve is sort of super-duper independent agency, 12 years terms of these governors and they're not really subjected to political pressure. The Treasury Department just serves at the leisure of the president. So we've got this kind of constitutional structure for how we oversee these organizations and I don't think anybody has any idea which functions of regulatory oversight fit best within all those different boxes or whether we need something totally different. Okay, Randy, I, I just want to get back to the question about AIG and how that was different from sure. Lehman. I'm sorry? I think actually, Randy, just explaining well, but, but other people might want to know the answer too. Right? <laughs> um, the um, um, AI, AIG was the person that was, 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 had written a lot of these um, credit default swaps. And so people made the judgment, right or wrong, they might do it over again, that the credit default swaps were so large with respect to AIG that it would have a, a, a ripple effect that would be much larger than the Lehman ripple effect. That was the thinking for whatever reason. Please, right there. Can you made the point there could be other factors why we're seeing the number of loans being made go down. But it also, there is the possibility that the truck could really be broken, and maybe there's not as many loans being made as there really should be if everything's working. H how can we tell? <laughs> John? John? Uh, well, you've got the stories. Um, the central story is that uh, the banks can't make loans because they're stuck at their capital requirements, and for some mysterious reason don't want to issue equity and make more loans. Uh, I'm, I'm frankly very suspicious of this story. Um, we're told the banks can't borrow from each other uh, and therefore they can't make loans. Well, as I pointed out, if you can't borrow from another bank, you can borrow from the Fed. That's what being a bank means. And for every bank that can't borrow, that means there's a bank who can't find anywhere to lend, so they ought to be making loans like crazy. Uh, I sniff the banking system unwilling uh, to make loans as opposed, or, or no demand for loans as opposed to unable to do it. There's um, also people on the opposite side of all of these bets. So there is some deadweight loss component to the housing bubble crashing, but for everybody who was long, there was a long houses, there was a person who was short houses. So there are a bunch of people, and they're probably individuals or small hedge funds, who shorted houses, and they are literally you know, burning money for the sake of fun, just because they've got so much money. Uh, and those people, you know, there was a Wall Street Journal story about one individual guy who bet short houses and made $15 billion, and that was many, many months ago. A guy. 15 billion. Uh, that guy should have a little sign in front of his apartment in New York that says, you need money, come here, I'll loan it to you. Uh, and I'm not sure why those people haven't come out of the woods oh, yet. Oh, I, th I, think, I, think it's, I, th I think a lot of them basically are really anxious to testify in front of Congress and explain why they've, yeah, why they've yeah. done this. So, so, the, so, so, so Douglas, has just, Douglas has just made my point about the New Deal and the persecution of people who made money in these situations and why that, that, that is a real problem that keeps this liquidity out of the system. Uh, and then, the, then you'd also want to ask the question of whether or not those people need to be banks, whether there's some reputational value, whether people just wouldn't trust dealing with them, especially if we're trying to attract foreign capital to the country to, to increase the reserves, whether the foreigners, you know, you're in China, you don't really want to funnel cash through Frank on 53rd Street who made 15 billion, you really want to go through an established entity. But I would say you can look at the prices, which are not out of line. If, if you have a job and a down payment, you get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage for about 5.5% right now. And the last comment is, of all people who should be cheering when house prices decline and the stock market crashes, it's you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to get to buy a house much cheaper than you possibly thought, and you're going to get to buy stocks for your retirement at very good prices. This is fantastic news for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Uh, an, alternative, uh, an alternative explanation for why the banks aren't lending, you, you, well, it's not that they've hit their capital ratios, it's that they have no idea who they're lending to, because they don't know what's on the balance sheet of these huge entities. These, these overnight loans of billions and billions of dollars only work if you have faith that it's going to get paid back the next day. And if as soon as you hear a whiff of a rumor about somebody in trouble, everybody stops loaning to them. So I'm sort of wondering why we haven't talked about forced write downs, why the government as part of their equity investment didn't say, clean up your books, like tell the market how solid you are. The ones who aren't solid will stop lending, we'll fold them up. The ones who are solid, the machinery will start working. 
forced write down, a forced debt to equity conversion. That's exactly how you do my sort of synthesis of a clean bankruptcy. But, you know, but to do that, but, you know, be, but I think your point is before bankruptcy, you, what we really like to know is what assets do these banks really hold? Because you know, there's a fear now that they hold a lot of garbage. And, and you know, John, maybe John's attitude is they hold garbage, let's get rid of them. But um, you know, that's fine, but you have to know which ones are holding the garbage. I, I would just say quickly, um, uh, the, the notion that I won't loan to a bank now because I think they might fail should be belied by everything Professor Picker put up on the board in the first instance. There's absolutely no way the government is going to allow a large bank to fail. That's probably been established for at least the last week. And going forward, there's absolutely no way that that is possible. My second point is the fact that the bailout has, to echo what John said about they rolled this out as a public relations matter that was, it was horrible uh, in terms of building confidence, doesn't help that Bush has absolutely no credibility or moral authority in the country anymore. Uh, that certainly doesn't help the case. But the notion that I now have assets on my balance sheet that are worth 10, I could sell them for 10, but I don't know what the government's going to do. The government might pay me 80 sometime down the road. I'm not going to sell them. I'm going to wait for the government. And the delay of the bailout has only exacerbated the freeze. All right, one or two more questions. Go ahead, right here. Um, I had a couple. The first was, the first was related to this right down point. It seems to me that we've criticized mark to market economy. Now, how are we going to get to value those assets if they're not valued by the market? It seems like we'd just be making up values. Um, and inflating the values of these assets that we're supposed to be right now. And the second was, I wonder if we're too cynical about the role of the government um, as an investor. We've seen the government do this before. Like they've made loans to Mexico while other governments are making sovereign wealth fund loans. And it seems to me that the government is basically acting as a venture capitalist. They're going to come in, they're taking preferred stock and so forth. They're going to trim down the companies. Five to seven years they get out, hopefully, with a profit to the taxpayers. Why would they have to be bad at doing that? Like two. Our, our government has simultaneously said in the Treasury Bill, we want to buy up these mortgage assets and try to make money on them. And they also said, we're going to protect homeowners and make sure we don't foreclose mortgages and bail people out of their mortgages. You can't do both. If you don't make people pay back the mortgages, the mortgages are worthless as an asset. So it, it, you got to be heartless if you're going to be a distressed debt venture fund. Our government's not going to be, and it probably shouldn't be heartless, which means it shouldn't be in the business of being a distressed debt venture fund. And, if, and, if, if, and I think, you know, you take that attitude, well then, why doesn't the government, uh, uh, why don't they have, we have them in charge of energy policy? Why don't we have them in charge of health care policy? Why don't we have them in charge of, you know, all the things, you know, should they be running the auto company? Should they, I mean, well, you know, three it's, 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 now it's, you'll know what yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, the things that the government uh, does now, uh, you know, whether it's Iraq, or running the public school system in Chicago, they do a pretty crappy job at. And so I just am, I'm just worried for the for the reasons political economy that John just suggested. Uh, I go back to uh, Aaron Director, a great University of Chicago uh, uh, economist, who said uh, uh, all extensions of government activity should be presumed should be viewed under a presumption of error. Uh, and if you start from there, I, I view this as a big presumption of error. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, I just want to address the question that you have. I mean, something that I've heard that seems to make a lot of sense for me is that the government, when it steps in, in terms of having both interest, trying to maximize value of these assets, maximize the cost of the mortgages, has a coercive authority that the market doesn't have in its, in it by itself to, for example, restructure some of these mortgages or to put people you know, into certain plans where you're going to be able to avoid foreclosure. And yeah, the, the loan might not be as valuable as it was written face value, but if you avoid foreclosure, you might get 60 cents on the dollar instead of 40 cents on the dollar due to the loss of some foreclosure and that sort of thing. So Banks do that, that every day. What's that? Banks do that every day. But, but aren't the banks having a huge problem doing that right now because they're having trouble get, having the authority to restructure these loans because they don't hold these loans anymore because they've been sold off? So loans tell, another thing I would hope lawyers do is rewrite the fine print in mortgage-backed securities. There is some... There, there is some ability to restructure loans that are mortgage-backed securities, but not as much as we'd want. Loans that are held by banks, they can and do restructure all the time. Right. And, they're, and this is a hard business. You tell me you can't pay the mortgage, and I got to say, well, is he lying, and I really can squeeze it out of him, or is it really true, and I got to cut the mortgage down, and that. That's not one, that, that's one that's best left to the parties involved, exactly as you said. Yeah, but I, I want to underscore that, that this is a real problem. These contracts are written up in such a way. They're not written cleanly, and they're not written in a way so that at least you agree that banks, that we ought to have contracts that allow mortgages in these securitized vehicles to be rewritten as well as they could be written if, if an individual But it's delicate them. because it's delegated. Yep. I'm delegating to you. Yes, that's why I'm hard line. line. Exactly. Yeah, okay, 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 so, I'm sorry, you want, to, you want to optimize the way that agency contract but is they written. thought they did, probably. Yeah, I, I, we got to stop. 
<laughs> Thank you very much.